Good morning, Family Church. Welcome to our series, Love Built This. In our final installment today, we're going to talk specifically about how love built this church. This week, I had the wonderful opportunity to sit down with my pastor, my dad, the founder of the Family Church, Pastor Sterling Miller. We reminisced and talked about the 46-year journey that we have been on that all began in 1973. Enjoy our conversation. All right, Dad, here we are, 46 years later. You know, this Easter, we'll celebrate our 46th year anniversary. Today, we sit on approximately 90 acres, still growing, still under construction. Tell us a little bit about what you saw on this property in 1973 when you got here. I think what I saw is just the possibility of having a building on location and uh, establishing a, a church. And uh, we had a vision to establish a Christian school. And the purpose for coming to Lafayette was to pioneer a Christian education in the area for the sake of our children and uh, for the sake of the community. So a church foundation was not just for a local church, it was also for a ministry for the whole family and for those that are being called to the ministry for missions, or pastoral work and establishing other ministries across the, across the country and, and around the world. And that vision that vision is still going forth. You have a grandson, my son Reagan, who's actually in Mexico on a 90-day mission experience now. So that vision of sending missionaries and raising up pastors is still going strong today. Dad, talk a little bit about when Interstate 10 opened over the Atchafalaya Basin Bridge. You talk about how that when you came back, you were pastoring in Church Point at the time, and you passed over the interstate, you looked down and you saw that piece of property that we sit on today. What did you see, not only in the spirit, but what did you see in the natural? What did this place look like when you saw it in, for the first time? There was nothing in the area as far as, uh, you know, as far as any development uh, from, from armor uh, back to university, there was a couple of homes there in, in that area, but down here where the church is, there wasn't any, any, anything on location. And so when we came across the spillway, uh, that's when uh, we came over the overpass here, the Lord spoke to our heart to come to Lafayette and we saw all this vacant area, open area. It would be a good place to establish a, a, a church and a, and a school to have access to all the the, the traffic flow being right off of I-10. Talk about that service. How many people were here that first first Sunday? Our first Sunday we had 13 people for our first service. And uh, besides our four, you know, the four, Gene and I and, and you and Joe Beth, you know. Yeah, so that had been 17, so man, y'all were packed. But we started out believing God for the miraculous. And, but everything is built around a seed. There's no harvest without a seed. You have to plant yourself in a vision before the vision is manifested. And so this whole ministry is, a, is you know, our part of it was a, we planted a seed, a vision for it. Had no idea it would grow up to be what it is now, but we had a vision for the school and a vision for the church and for discipling people for the ministry. Obviously, mom played a vital role in those early days, um, you know, and we got to watch her play that role for 40 plus years here at the ministry before she passed away. But how critical was mom's role in those early, early days? She was probably the, the key connection to reaching families. Uh, we, we were able to start a bus ministry not very long after we established the church. And she would go into neighborhoods and meet parents and their kids and reach, reach out to them and bus them to, to church and Sunday school. But she, she really was a, an outreach and she had Sunday school, she had children's church and she had a bus ministry. 
in all besides the Lord Jesus himself, probably was the greatest uh, harvest seed of, of the ministry, you know. Talking about Lafayette Christian Academy, 1974, it opened its doors. Do you remember how many students it started had, out with? I, I want to think we had 24, 20, 25. Our first year of graduation class, we had two people to graduate in 75. And that was a big graduating class for us. We had never had one before. Well, it's not two anymore. Um, the graduating class this year will be around 60. And uh, next year, the graduating class will be right at 90. You know, we went from 24 kids in 1974, and currently we're at 1,100 plus. And next year, we're gonna be close to that 1,300 mark kindergarten through 12th grade. So it's really amazing. You know, when you came to Lafayette, obviously there was the Interstate 10 and I-49 was probably developed uh, years later, but we're right on I-10 and I-49. One thing interesting about Lafayette Christian Academy is we draw students now from seven different parishes. And that's simply because of the interstate system of I-10 and I-49. So what was just a empty field was really, um, was really the potential to do something amazing that we saw now 46 years later. Dad, um, one of the scriptures that the ministry was founded on was 1 Corinthians 1-7, so that we come behind in no gift while waiting on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when that was deposited in your spirit, what did that mean to you at the time? And what does that mean to you today? Today, it's still in all of our classes and all of our campuses, that scripture. What does that mean? Well, uh, scripture, God gave me this scripture in, in Bible college in Dallas, Texas. I was very discouraged being in Bible college. I'd never been to Sunday school one day in my life when I got saved, you know, and called to the ministry. And uh, I was, negotiating with the Lord and telling the Lord that if he let me go back and run a rig, I used to drill, be a driller in the off field, I could help support missionary. And I'm there on Barry Avenue in Dallas, Texas at our little apartment. And God spoke to my heart to go to 1 Corinthians, read 1 Corinthians 1, 7. And that's kind of how I got all anchored in. And so then that's when we renewed our mind and I renewed my mind, I should say. Uh, to, to be in, uh, in the will of God. And, and so the gifts of not coming behind in any gift is all part of the manifestation of the will of God. And you know that, um, that, that vision of God will always make a way and that you come behind in no gift. We, we relate it even to our staff today. We talk about when, when you need it, God will supply. When the time is for the vision to speak, everything will be in order. And we've seen that happen even in the last 20 years um, under me as the pastor here at the family church. Um, we've been able to buy property that wasn't for sale with money we didn't have. And you know, we started out at two and a half acres um, and then went to 20 acres, 30, 40, and now 90 plus acres and still continue to grow and expand um, you know, there was property around us that we were told that it would never be for sale. And at the right time when we needed it, all of a sudden that property became available. And so we're still seeing that same vision that God gave you. We're still seeing that vision still speaking. Dad, one of the things you talk a lot about, I've heard you mention, is that you and mom, y'all made an agreement never to quit on the same day which tells me that there were some, some tough times. What were some of those tough times and how did you make it through those tough times? Well, I think some of them were, of course, uh, needs for the family, you know, because uh, the, the resources were very limited. So that was one of the needs. And in second, in 1 Corinthians 1, 7, he says, so that you come behind and no gifts. But in verse number eight, he says, pray that God perfects everything that concerns you. And when we ask God to perfect that which concerns us, then sometimes the thought is, I ought to be doing something else besides what I'm doing. 
because I think that's, that would probably be something God could bless. And so we covenanted not to quit at the same time. So if I got discouraged and said, hey, we need to go ahead and turn this thing over to someone else and let's move on to another opportunity. And then Jean, your mother would stand up and say, but no, we have an agreement with God. We're in covenant with God that we're not going to do anything unless we're in agreement. And so if you and I are not in agreement in this situation, then it means we're going to wait on God to develop the agreement or we're going to stand fast, unmovable, and that's what we're doing. Um, what a journey it's been. You know, Dad, your birthday is March 14th. We're just a few, few, few days away from March 14th now, and um, you'll be 81 years old. Do the math. How old were you when you came to no, the church in 73? I wasn't 81. <laughs> <laughs> I was in my low 30s, you know. Yeah. Probably 32 or 33. Now, Dad, you were here for, you, you served as pastor for 29 years. And in, uh, I, I remember in 2001, you came to me and Tessie and you said, hey, mom and I season is over here for this time. And, and Jay, I want you and Tessie to take over the church and pastor and take over the school. When you made that transition, what were you, what were you thinking or how, why that time? Well, I think because of the generational transition that was taking place, one, one of the reasons. Young people back, back in those days and even today, uh, you reach out to them differently than we did in our, in our culture. Although it's the same gospel, but it's a different culture that you have to reach out to people to bring them to Christ. It was more of a transition of outreach. And so we saw that, and then we saw you and Tessie, the possibility of reaching out and making and seeing that transition, you know, take place. And it's taking place here in the church, you know. Yeah. You know, Dad, in the last 18 years, as Tessie and I have been pastors here and of the family church president of Lafayette Christian, there's, um, there's been several defining moments um, for us. I think back of 2006 when we had saved a large portion of money and we were about to build a new school building. When the numbers came back on that building that we had saved up for, it was in excess of $9 million. And, you know, $9 million is still a lot of money, but it was a whole lot of money 15 years ago. And I was just so devastated. Um, and just broken hearted. I remember physically going out to the football field and was just crying before the Lord because um, I missed it. I missed the number, I missed the figure, the timing. And, and I remember the Lord spoke to me and said, call the pastor next door. If you remember, there was a church next door to us on 15 acres and they never wanted to sell it. Selling was never going to be an option. And I picked up the phone and I called the pastor and I said, hey, I'm calling about your property and I was actually calling about a little three acre track he had in the back. And at that moment he said, let's talk, let's go have coffee at Starbucks. Um, don't just buy a piece of the pie, buy the whole pie. And that was really a defining moment. Um, you know, probably that first big God defined moment as pastor here when God gave us basically access to 15 acres. Um, fast forward a number of years now and we, I, we couldn't even do ministry the way we do it without that property. So it was definitely a defining moment. Can you think back in your time here of some defining moments where, um, where God just came through at the last minute or did something uh, that you just knew it was the hand of God. Well, I think uh, the property here on this, where we're at right now, on this side of the street was a was one defining moment when it became available, and we were able to possess, because we didn't own anything on 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 this side of the street. Everything was on on Portland, uh, I mean on Stone, on the Portland side of it, and we didn't have anything. And then the uh, the Jehovah Witnesses building a a deal back there. So I went and I walked across that slab when they poured it and claimed it for Jesus. 
And we just prayed and believed God for that piece of property. And it didn't happen instantly, but it did happen. And one day God gave it to, to the church and the church owns it, you know. And so God's timing and our timing is not necessarily what we expect, but it's the manifestation of His, His will if we trust Him. Dad, one of the things that you've always been passionate about and always preached is the, uh, the commitment to the local church. Why has the local church been just um, so key to your heart uh, for all of these years? Well, I think, I think the local church is the only true vision mission for the local community. If your emphasis is not on the local church, you're not going to reach your community. So we put emphasis on the local church and, and on people coming to church, bringing their families to church. And, and I can remember some of the staff people that you have on staff. When they first came to church, the first service they came, they accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. And so that's why we put emphasis on such a, on the local church. You know, If you connect with the local church, we're going to reach out to you and you're going to reach out uh, to the community. Uh, one thing I learned about, about Christ is that everything naturally should grow. Um, the church ought to always be growing, ought to always be expanding because there's more people that need Christ, more people to reach. And, and so um, I, I'm just grateful that the vision has never stopped. You know, I've been at this for 18 years now, been at it all my life, but, um, and I look forward, just as you pass that baton to the next generation, there'll come a time where I'll pass that baton to hopefully one of my, one of my own kids and your grandsons, and um, you just never know what God has. Basically, all of them are working for the ministry now, and I know mom would be proud of knowing that all of our grandsons are loving Jesus and working for the Lord and using their gifts and talents for His service. Um, and so uh, I'm a proud daddy just to be, able to, to be able to say that my kids serve the Lord, love the Lord, and uh, are being, using their gifts and talents. And uh, so Dad, I just want to thank you for trusting God. Um, hasn't always been easy. You know, if you look back at where I was raised and how I was raised, you can't but say it was the Lord's doing. Never went to, never went to a gospel church in my life. I married a, a lady that was a born again believer and her mother was an intercessor of prayer for you. And they believed God for my salvation came out of the military. I'm at home one day and this preacher came to my house and led me to the Lord. And I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I was the first person in my family to receive the Lord. But, but the, the salvation that God brought to me was His grace. And then He, 30 days after He saved me, he calls us into the ministry. And you talk about a, a brand new voice for the Lord without knowing the Bible. But God's grace is sufficient, amen. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 12, and in the Message Bible, it reads something along these lines. It says, do you see what all this means? Um, the pioneers, those that have went before you, cheering you on. So what does that mean for us? Get on with it. In other words, I take that to mean, hey, keep moving forward with the vision. Keep plowing ahead um, because we got a lot of greats that are in heaven, mom being one of them, that uh, she's still cheering us on today. Every time someone stops me and reminds me of an encounter they had with mom, I go back to Hebrews 12 where the Lord spoke and said, now the pioneers have done their job. Now you get on with it. So it inspires me to love like she loved, believe the best in others like she did. And, um, and so she's cheering us on in heaven, cheering on her grandkids. 
So to the family church, I say to all of you, get on with it. Amen. Get on with it. And this is a little bit of insight of how love built this church. Amen.